I worked in, in AI, machine learning, those fields for probably more, well more than three decades. And once my hair turned completely white, I decided it's time that I took some responsibility. And you know, the thing is that we all learn, if you're an engineering faculty, you'll all learn engineering ethics. And that's all about ethical principles uh, regarding your client. So if your client tells you to make a very big gun, you have to make sure it kills a maximum number of people. But I think uh, certainly the Royal Academy of Engineering in the UK have tried and, and not been very successful in trying to get across the idea of social responsibility of scientists. And in the UK, we have a social impact factor now, but, it, but we really got to move along. We've got to take responsibility for the technology we create. Um, this um, uh, foundation for responsible robotics that you can see there was created less than a year ago uh, I'm a co-director and we got 20 plus of the top technology scholars in the world who are concerned about these issues. We got together and we're growing really fast and anybody can become a member, whether you're a graduate student, uh, uh, undergraduate or a member of staff. It costs you more depending on what you are. But have a look at our website and, and we've got lots of different working groups within robotics, uh, social scientists, lawyers, philosophers, and roboticists, of course, computer scientists. So what I want to talk about is the worldwide numbers in robotics in particular. I mean, I'm concerned about all technology, but are, they're really increasing dramatically. Um, and we've got this idea of industrial robots versus service robots. Now, industrial robots, as you know, have been on the planet since Unimate back in the 1950s. And you know, there's a million and a half of those operational on the planet at the minute. But service robots have only been around since, really been around since the turn of the millennium. And we've already got millions of those. I mean, in 2014 alone, we had um, 4.7 4 million were sold for personal and domestic use. Uh, for elder care, assistive elder care went up by over 400% at that point. And a sort of conservative prediction by the World Federation of Robotics is 38 million by 2018. It's a fairly conservative estimate. So service robots, unlike the distinction between service robots and industrial robots is indu service robots are not industrial robots. That's it. They're everything else. Um, for instance, these are service robots. That's a, a burger maker. Uh, in a new restaurant in San Francisco, it can make 400 burgers an hour. There are some that can chop fast meat and serve them up quicker than if somebody can flip a McDonald's burger. Um, there's sushi restaurants in Japan now that are completely automated. This is getting very big. And the, the former CEO of uh, McDonald's said last week that if workers would s should stop insisting on pay rises or they will be replaced by robots. And it's this distinct possibility. Look at the swathes of jobs that are going to be lost for people who, well, either students or the less educated of, among us. And that's an that's a, a automatic server you've got in, in Singapore. So you just type your drink into an iPad and this autonomous device here, it looks like a tray with propellers, brings it to you. They avoid each other. It's quite, it's quite interesting to see. On cruise ships all over the place now, there are cocktail makers, so you can even put in your own recipe and it will shake it up, do it for you. And so there's a, there's a certain responsibility we have towards this idea of jobs, but I'm not going to go on about that because there's too many other issues. Here's Amazon drone deliveries. We're planning these in the UK. It's suddenly upon us, the government suddenly announced that it's working with Amazon to have drone deliveries. A hundred foot wide highway through London, 400 feet up, just beneath he helicopter level. And will we ever see the sun again? Because they won't stay on the highway, they have to go all over the place. Um, other companies, two other companies have announced ground delivery of robots. Starship Robotics is going to start delivering food and they tell me that their main thing will be late night alcohol deliveries to young people who are partying all night. So there's these robots on the ground. Domino Pizza started uh, in, in New Zealand with flying pizza drones. So pizza hair is gonna become a thing of the future. Um, we've also got them delivering in Enschede in Netherlands with ground robots. So where are all these going to go? You're going to be tripping over robots and they're going to be coming down, hitting you in the head. I mean, it, there's no real joined up thinking about this. 
People are talking about having their own personal drones carrying their water for them and out for a run. But nobody's thinking about how many hundreds of thousands of these things can we have in our airspace? How many ground robots can we have for deliveries? I mean, I'm passionate about robotics. I love it. And there's so much good work going on looking at examining freshness of water in Africa, protecting endangered species, etc. But we've really got to do some thinking here big thinking, overall thinking. Okay, so what I work on really is ethical issues. This is some of the ethical issues you can see here. And there are trade-offs with these ethical issues. They're not all uniform. So you might trade off an old person's autonomy for, the better, for their welfare. Uh, you might, I would trade my privacy for 24-hour surveillance when I have a heart attack called intensive care. So there are trade-offs in all the ethics. But the one thing about it is these areas, here's some of the areas, elder care, child care, a no-no for me. Elder care, brilliant for assistive care. You've got things that can wash you, feed you, get you sitting upright in the morning, could keep you in your home for a lot longer, exoskeletons. Then there's all this stuff about companion robots for the elderly, which are not so, so really good. Um, so you've got to worry about their privacy and ver their autonomy, those, those sorts of issues, their dignity above all. Um, robots coming into medicine, surgery, sex robots are getting very prevalent in the press and I, I made a mistake of saying one sentence and I've got nine, nine national papers about it. All I said was it might harm people if it was their first sexual experience and the newspaper headlines were uh, professor warns that teens are British teens are going to lose their virginity to robots. You know, that's what, that's it. So I'm not going to say anything today in case there's anybody else here. Um, then we've got self-driving technologies and you know you've had the big Tesla crash uh, in the United States but it turns out there was one in January in China as well. And I believe that self-driving technology probably could save lives on the roads, probably, if we get it right, if we have joined up roads with cameras and everything else. But I wish companies would stop this meme of they will save lives. We don't know that yet. There's no evidence for it. And now everybody who talks about autonomous cars immediately says they will save lives. Elon Musk said that there was, he had driven, the Tesla had driven 130 million miles before its fatality. The average in the United States of fatalities is one every 94 million miles. So he said, do the maths. If everybody had been using a Tesla, we'd have saved half a million lives. Well, I did the math, and it turns out that those fatality statistics include pedestrians, cyclists, people in caravans, any road fatality whatsoever. And when you look at the real detailed statistics, it's one car occupant is killed every 264 million miles. So if he was to do the math on his reasoning, a million more people would be dead if everybody was driving Teslas. And I don't think the math was right in the first place. So, so the next thing is, one of the things I work on a lot is autonomous robots and policing. Now autonomous robot weapons I discovered in 2007 uh, when some, some journalists asked me questions and I was horrified when I read about them. I read all the US plans because they're an open information society and I've spent the last three years of my life pretty constantly going to the UN uh, advocating against their use and we're making really good headway. We have this thing which I'm on the leadership of called the Campaign to Stop Killer Robots which has a lot of major NGOs like Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, a lot of Nobel laureates, a lot of religious leaders, etc., including the Pope, uh, behind it. And so we're, we've been working very hard at the UN and it's very slow progress. United States is developing autonomous submarines, uh, ships, all sorts of ships, tanks and fighter jets. I'm going to show you one of the jets. Russia is particularly big on tanks because Russia have always been big on tanks and they have the Armati tank, which the US military advisors assure me is 20 years ahead of anybody else's in the world and they're making that fully autonomous. And I, for one, don't like the idea of these massive super tanks fully autonomous on the borders of Europe. So there are many arguments against these that we've put forward. One is that I can see no way that we can guarantee compliance with the laws of war. And I can argue that out with anybody here who, who wants to really discuss it for a number of reasons. Um, we also have the problem of some people argue that a machine should never be allowed or delegated 
with the decision to kill a human. It should always be under human control, and I agree with that, really. Uh, even, even life support systems, whatever. Um, and the other one is, if we look at international security, this is not going to help. This could create international conflicts. The big thing for me is everybody's talking about swarms of these. I mean, you should hear the military talking about these. It's really very scary. They're talking about swarms of them. So the United States can't win in the Pacific at the moment. So they're talking about swarms of these fighter jets, I'm going to show you, going into, going into China against China. And all of the think tanks who talk about this talk about it from the point of view that Chinese um, military technology will stay identical to it is today, which is stupid because they're developing them like crazy as well. Now, any computer scientists in this room, what happens when you pit an unknown algorithm against another own unknown algorithm? Can anybody answer that question? Of course you can't because we have no idea what will happen. Now, nobody's going to reveal their combat algorithm unless they're absolutely stupid because then you can just defeat it. So you take swarms of one person's technology with unknown combat algorithms, another person's swarm, I don't know what's going to happen. It's a real worry for international security generally. I mean, I'm, I'm cutting this very, very short, but all of the things I've talked about, I've written papers on, they're easy to find and access, okay. What I'm saying here is I suppose that we're, we seem to be sleepwalking into this. In the same way as we sleptwalked into the, the internet, we had no idea, we just let it happen. The internet was fine for us academics for a very long time, but then suddenly you get the World Wide Web and none of us were expecting internet shopping or internet porn or any of those things. Well, I certainly wasn't. Um, don't know about the rest of you, the old guys there. Um, they might have been expecting all sorts of things. Uh, so, so what can we do about this? Well, one of the things is, that's bothersome is with all of this technology coming, and as I say, people consider one application, like I'm worried about the, the military, and I haven't even talked about the policing. Policing is getting very extensive in its use in the global south, using pepper spray from helicopters, tasering, those things. And the United States, uh, North Dakota passed a bill in November allowing the police there to arm their drones with less than lethal weapons so they could fire rubber bullets, pepper spray, tasers, those kinds of things. So when you've got all this technology put together, we must really think as a society, we must really think broadly about what control do we want to cede to machines? What do we want our machines to be able to do? I mean, you're going to go into your house, you're going to have machines, the internet of things, all competing with each other and conflicting and goodness knows what. It's like a Woody Allen movie. I don't know if you know the story of all, the, all his different devices ganging up on him. So we don't, we don't know really what, what we're moving into here. And how do we stop this? Well, joined up thinking about the big picture would really help getting our governments to look at this. Um, the, the Foundation for Responsible Robotics has partnered with Unicri, which is an official UN organization who are interested in AI and robotics. They're a crime organization. They, they're not criminals. They're you know, against crime. Um, they're not like the mafia. So um, they can get us access to other parts of the UN that I don't usually go to. I always go to the CCW or the Human Rights Council. So we're looking at... Uh, many, many things, and the idea would be that we set up, how do, you, how do you set up regulation? People talk about soft law, soft regulations, all those things, but how do you protect it into the future? Because technology is changing all the time. The only way I can think of doing it, and this is what we're putting to the Human Rights Council, is a new bill of human technological rights that says what technology can do to us what control should be ceded technology. So it focuses so strictly on the human, not on the tech. Because, we're, well, I suppose we are evolving, but I'm not worried about a million years time, I'm just dealing with the present. So this would protect us in some way. Of course, it's gonna be another 10 or 15 years before we can get anything like this together. But we have to start now. And particularly a lot of you younger people, I mean, we're really relying on you. It's your children and your grandchildren who are going to suffer from all of this. So you really need to get your acts together. Uh, think about responsibility. Think about what you're creating and do something about it. Okay, let me stop there. <laughs>